Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Three Seconds Ahead with me, Andrew Johnson, uh, where we meet with um, ordinary people who have extraordinary stories. Uh, uh, my guest today is an, an old friend. That he is a well-respected, well-known, highly regarded artist and sculptor around the world. He's also a man of um, deep uh, um, conviction and faith, uh, of which I have a massive amount of respect for. And um, he's a father of four amazing children. He's an athlete. He's run numerous um, Two Oceans marathons, amongst other things. And uh, as I said, he's my friend. So, um, oh, he also enjoys the outdoors. Every now and then I see a picture of him uh, going out in his surf ski, catching some fish so he can feed that wonderful families of his. So, um, Duncan, really welcome. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate your time. And I suppose for those people that uh, don't know you, I think the big, best place to begin is, is where does your story begin? Uh, Great. Thanks. Lovely to join you, Andy. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I think my story begins in nature. And I assume when I go back to the grave, it will end in nature. In a way. Um, but definitely growing up where I did in the beautiful highlands of the Eastern Transvaal was formative. I um, grew up as the youngest, also of four siblings. And, uh, and all of my formative years, the ones, those years that psychologists and analysts and all those clever people, psychiatrists say, are critical to our development. All of my development happened in between rivers and trees and mud and monkeys. And, uh, and I'm incredibly grateful for that upbringing. Um, so formatively, my mind is one that was shaped by wide open spaces, by contemplation of the beauty in nature, by wondering how light could be transmitted to a dewdrop you know all of those little miracles mm. that are around us every day but as a kid they are startling when you first notice them mm -hmm. so i think a, a large part of me becoming who i am today the curiosity the the exploration the the wonder about how things work uh the appetite for understanding how things all fit together began uh, as a little kid running around uh, on a farm. Yeah, and I was very fortunate to spend some time on that uh, beautiful farm. Um, so it does definitely, it touches my heart because I do remember the good times we had there together. I think, Dunks, my, my first question to you then is, are there any or is there a particular experience that you had um, in these formative years, as you've put it, that has stuck with you and in a, in a material way impacted your belief system. And um, the second half of that is, does it still impact your belief system today? Um, I suppose there, there are always going to be um, moments. Some of them are understood and, and considered and conscious. We're conscious of them. And there are others that I'm probably far less conscious of that have molded the soul and the person and the, the courage and the fear that is Duncan. Uh, so, you know, all of those things, we can't always, part of the artist's journey is to, is to work out what, how we tick and why we tick and, and what's important and what's of most value. I think those are the great questions yeah. for humanity and will continue to be. It's like, why are we here? What's the point? Um, and, you know, I think I just had this natural inkling to draw and to paint. Uh, and the amazing thing was I had this ability, mm -hmm. which was effortless. And so if you ask me one of the formative things, you know, I think it could have been as simple as a silver star, not even gold, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on an artwork submitted to a Sunday school arts and crafts market. But I remember those moments. And I also remember um, in primary school being selected, my artwork was selected for a national competition. Yeah. And I thought, I thought I... I, that this was very surprising <laughs> that this was attributed to me. And, um, 
but it's uh, it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting journey because it kind of began to highlight for me that I had some natural aptitude, natural advantage. That part of how what I believe God made me included this skill set of mm. being able to draw mm. and paint and make stuff. And yes. um, so, if you ask me that, I mean, winning that competition <laughs> and and some of those little moments where people have spoken over your life, whether it be a teacher or a parent or someone in authority in that field where they say, wow, you're really good at this. And you believe it, it resonates with your mm. soul. And, uh, and so I've always just tucked those little moments away and thought, well, you know, dear auntie Ethel said yeah. I was very good at drawing when I was six. So that must be true. <laughs> it's funny if you hold on to something as true, it is largely powerful. Whether that is true or not, sometimes obviously we all hold on to many untruths and those have, dire consequences yeah. uh, to our potential. And that's interesting. I just, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to comment on. Firstly is it's, it was wonderful not only to see, but to feel your face light up when you remember that experience um, of winning that competition and saying to yourself, almost like, but was I sure that it was me that won this? You know, and, and that sort of spark that got you going I mean, I can, I can, I'm pleased to ask the question because it's obviously a memory that you haven't recalled for many years and it's really, lit, it lit up your face. So I'm glad that we had that little chat. But what really struck me about what you said is, um, is the word truth. And if you hold on to a truth, well, then it's true. Whether that truth is of value to you or not. Um, and the powerful illustration of a, a valuable truth is when you started really believing, I can do this, I can paint, I can, I can be an artist, I can create. So um, are there any other areas in your life where that truth, I think a, a good question at this point is, are there any truths that you've abandoned because you've realized that they were of no value to you? And was that a, a difficult journey for you? Yeah, um, yeah I, think th I think it's always a difficult journey because it's always, you built your life on what you think is foundational. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're trying to build the best lives we can with the best amount of information and reasoning and mm -hmm. faith that we all have. Um, but, but events happen and things happen that shape the very core of what we believe. Mm -hmm. And it's enormously uncomfortable uh, uh, to be vulnerable to the point to accept that I might be wrong and, uh, and that actually all that I've held on to, all that I've built around, as comfortable and secure as I am in it being familiar, it's not true or it's not, it's not good. And uh, I suppose the, the, the greatest shift fundamentally in terms of truth, so I believe truth is absolute. I believe truth is a person and that that person is the one and only person who said he is truth, which is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I was on a search for, uh, prior to, um, becoming a Christian. I, I did, um, a lot of investigation because I was, I was, I called myself in my own little private world that still stems from the little boy in the forest. I called myself a, very nobly a seeker of truth. So this is growing up through, from leaving sort of high school and going into my early twenties, I kind of, I embarked on a mission to find truth because I wasn't afraid of what, I wasn't, I, I never saw truth as being something that was going to be um, cynical or negative per se. It's kind of like the ocean. The ocean doesn't really care. It is brutal and powerful. And if you respect it, it will be what it is. It's not malicious in any way. And so I never expected truth when I found it to be malicious. And so I had no, ob no obstruction or no concerns about seeking truth. And so I went far and wide. I did um, uh, a lot of research and experimentation with world views. And I must say, I found a lot of wisdom and truths in them. But essentially, they all ended up with me having to uh, do the work, have me having to 
save myself, me having to think myself out of a box, me having to um, uh, surrender my intellect to some degree until I came to the person of Jesus. And, uh, and that's, there was a moment when I, I decided, when I actually had some profound experiences and on the back of that, I decided to, um, to embrace uh, Christianity and the person of Christ as the journey, as the way, as the path to life. And uh, so that meant letting go a lot of uh, friendships that weren't based in truth. It meant dealing with a lot of stuff inside of my heart that I had allowed to creep in, a lot of selfishness, a lot of uh, uh, worldliness um, that really interfered with who I felt I was created to be. So uh, that's a long way around. But in some ways, it's, uh, it's the best answer I can give. Yeah, that, that, Duncan, first of all, thank you for your, um, your candor. It's, um, as, a, as an old friend of yours, it's, it's wonderful to, to be let in like that. Um, and again, the, it, it wasn't the, the roundabout's way of it is actually really powerful because there's a lot of detail in there. And the detail for me is, is that like any transition, there was a degree of discomfort that was involved in it. Um, there was a degree of self-doubt and, and, and loss because you mentioned some friends that were no longer of, of service to you. Not that you didn't like them, but they just no longer fitted in anymore. That, that was quite painful for you. Um, but it was that truth, that faith um, for you that um, has allowed you to be that person that you felt you needed to be. And if I could be more direct, that feeling, that, that person that you would describe um, or refer to, how did you know that that was the picture and that you were willing to, to risk everything to move in that direction? Well, do you mean, uh, do you mean pre-following Jesus or post-following Jesus? Like before or after becoming a Christian? Well, I think uh, uh, for me, it sounds like it's a sort of a whole, the whole thing is a jeering because you're still doing it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, you know, as you get to know scriptures, um, it becomes more and more enlightening <laughs> as to how little one knows. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and I feel sometimes like I've only just begun. But, yeah. um, but you know, every man and woman and child has a measure of faith. Every person in the world believes something. Every human being has a worldview. They believe that if you do A, you'll reap B. Mm -hmm. And every person lives with a certain amount of hope and expectation, whether they be drug lords hoping for bigger markets, whether they be caregivers hoping that the people they care for get better, whether they be kids hoping to pass an exam, everybody is hoping for something better. And so as I began to question and look around and say, uh, I'm searching for truth. I came across a, a fascinating study. It was a bit of a thesis, but in it, it, it essentially, it preceded any belief. It's, it outlined world views, and I found this fascinating. So obviously, there, there's a monotheistic, pantheistic, atheistic. Uh, there's just a ton of isms and things out there in terms of what people believe. But what this article did, or what this uh, paper did, is it broke it down into two, four, into four very understandable philosophical questions, and it said if your worldview can satisfy these four questions to the best of your logic and reason, then that is, uh, then that is just from a purely philosophical point of view, then that is a worldview that can be entertained as not being in conflict with logic or reason. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the four questions that came up in this were, um, and I want to try and remember these very big words and then their definitions, but if I remember correctly, the the four questions were the teleological, epistemological, axiological, and ontological questions. Mm -hmm. And what they all deal with, so the first one is the, um, 
the I think it's the ontological, which is how did everything come to be where it is? How was everything created? The second one is axiological, is what is of um, highest value? What is the thing that is of most value within your worldview? What is the most precious thing? The epistemological is, how do we know what we know? Is it all information in a closed system or is there an outside sovereign supernatural uh, uh, manufacturer of knowledge or is it all of something past that? So those four questions, when looked at from a philosophical point of view are incredibly interesting especially if you hold them up against the filters of various worldviews and by worldviews i mean religions and things like that and to my mind and to my experience the christian biblical christian and, and i think there's a lot of weird christianity by the way but the biblical christian worldview satisfies my answers to those four questions fundamentally mm. better than any other belief system or worldview mm -hmm. and that's aside from my the physical experience and fruit that i've seen come through my life based on my uh a desire to follow this person jesus because you can always you know words are cheap mm -hmm. but actions communicate volumes i mean we all know that if you've got kids you can tell them what to do but they will do what you do yeah. and not what you say yeah. And, uh, and so when we begin to see, when I see fruit from my life that pleases me, and by that, I mean, what is the fruit I'm looking for? I'm looking for peace, joy, contentment, uh, um, respect in terms of someone who can be, a, uh, who people would entrust with, uh, with things uh, people would rely on someone, you know, are there those fruits in my life? And I know my selfish self. I know my lustful, corrupt self. I know it. But it's this amazing conviction that comes through the Holy Spirit that over years and years of desiring to follow him and believing that he's the way, the truth, and the life has produced a kind of fruit which I could never have, but I can give all the glory to God and say, that is, uh, I'm so grateful that you haven't abandoned me to myself. And, uh, and so I find there's something really powerful and dynamic within the biblical Christian worldview. And, um, and, and I've tasted and tested, and it's, it doesn't mean life gets easy. It mm -hmm. just gives it enormous significance and meaning mm -hmm. for all of those questions, if I can, yeah. if I can put it like that. Now that's, that is um, what, what's powerful about what you're saying is, is that, and you, you made reference that there are many different belief systems out there. Um, you have, through um, your seeking of truth, as you, you called it, have found one that resonates with you. Um, and you, your first step was to answer it logically, almost scientifically, through the quest, those four <laughs> questions that you raised. And then once, once there was a sort of a peace in those answers, you then had the courage to step into the experience. And um, I love what you said earlier about your children. You can tell them whatever you want, but they'll, they'll eventually actually just follow what you do. And, and I regularly say to, to my sons, I've got two sons who, and I say to them, please, you must never forget that you are how you behave. Not what you say. You are how you behave. That's, that's your truth. Um, and you then decided once you'd gone through that understanding, you went, okay, I'm going to step into this. I'm going to be this. And the reward, as you said, um, has been amazing. Um, all those values that you mentioned, uh, honesty, trustworthiness, kindness, gentleness, compassion, um, have all been rewarded to you through your action of being that. Uh, and that's really, really powerful. And a message to everybody is that at the end of the day, one can can um, think things or say things, but unless you actually do it, live it, experience it for yourself, there's actually very little wisdom or lesson in it. Um, so I don't know whether that rings true to you, but that's what I heard you say. You know, it, there's... Um... 
there's a there's a lot <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot in there um i mean let me just disclaimer i mean i'm i'm often i'm daily uh disappointed at my um and how much brokenness there still is in me. <laughs> but I'm daily encouraged by this person who is bigger than I am, who is eternal, who's got a future mm. and a hope for me, and who's on my case daily uh, in, a, in the best possible way that a father is looking for their children, yeah. uh, looking for, you know what it is? It's a, uh, we come into this world and we get conformed to the patterns and the systems of this world and god knows it's death to us and you will see tons of people in the throes of death especially through COVID. and i'm not talking because of the disease i'm talking because they have been ensnared by thoughts and systems that have placed who they are and their identity in what they do and how they compare mm. in the world. Now Christ comes along and says, you are not born when we give our lives to him because you need to be born again. The Bible says born in the spirit. So we're born of flesh and blood and then we're born again of the spirit. And when Jesus comes and does that work in a person's soul in their mind, will and emotions and, and in their spirit, which is even deeper, you become what the scriptures say is a new creation and you're no longer a slave to the things of the world. They still have enormous power over me. You know, I've still have to watch my heart when I get bitter at people that seem to be having an easier life than me or have mm. better stuff or, you know, or there's all of that yeah. petty stuff that is hundred percent alive in me. But, um, but I don't live for that stuff anymore. And there's a stronger, there's a stronger and a growing stronger um, spirit that responds to the things that lead to life. So I'm no longer conformed as much. Or I'm no longer under the same pressure as much to the things of this world. And I think the journey of an artist has accelerated that revelation for me because I've for so long had to depend. I don't know where our income is going to come from. I don't know where our next commission will come from. I don't know how. Uh, I'm ever going to support a family of four, six. I mean, six of us, including my wife and myself. But uh, but there's grown over the years this trust that God, yeah. as I follow him and as I seek his ways and I seek what's most meaningful. And for me, the most meaningful thing in life is that my life would be used to uh, inspire reconciliation to others, mm -hmm. to God, between others and God. For me... If people can find for themselves the love of God through any small little step that I've made or work I've created, then, then I, I don't get deeper satisfaction or fulfillment. Um, but it's a, you know, if I look at COVID and I look at the pressure and the fear and the concern, which is all absolutely valid, um, I think a lot of it is symptomatic of people having lost their moorings about who made them, that he's got a purpose for them. It's a great purpose that he cares and loves for them. You know, that's a, that's at the moment a bridge too far for so many people mm. to believe. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. it's what's interesting for me is, is that you spoke about finding your truth and the truth and what popped into my mind when you were talking earlier, uh, well, just a little bit earlier, is, is that it's almost a cliche, which is the truth will set you free. Um, and, and that's, we've kind of done a circular conversation to, to get to that point. And I would like to just throw something out there, which is not the truth will set you free, is your truth will set you free. And what Duncan did from a very young age um, and particularly after leaving high school, you were a seeker. So you went to find your truth and um, through different experiences, um, uh, Jesus Christ and Christianity became your truth. And it's, it's certainly um, uplifted you and set you free. Um, I think the, um, the value in what you're saying is, is a little bit early. You said it's, the external things, the things that are outside you, 
the cars, the houses, the this, the that, and you're referring to it about COVID because one's identity is so linked to what you have. Guys, that's not the answer. You know, you've got to look within. Um, and um, your truth and connecting with um, your God comes from within you. And that's how you will set yourself free. And again, that's what I've understood what you've said. And I don't know whether I'm off target or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree to a point, but I disagree in the sense that um, people don't get to determine what their truth is. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, let me put it this way. People don't get to determine what truth is. Truth is objective. It's outside of us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just say I believe that trees were God. Mm -hmm. You know, I can say that's, that's, that's my truth. Mm -hmm. um, and you believe that bicycles were God. And so you could say that the reality is that it doesn't take away from the fact that God made both of them. Mm -hmm. And the thing is about the Bible, it is, it's a... <laughs> It's a stumbling block because uh, it either Jesus either was a nutter, as you've as he, he's often been called, or he was who he says he was. So he has a man who demonstrated by the actions of his life and the fruit of his life remarkable miracles and wisdom. He called himself God. He called himself the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father. Now, that's very um, clear in terms of there is no other way to God. Mm. Now, I think what I've realized is that that doesn't disqualify many of the incredible, I'll put it this way, faiths and religions from teaching wise, brilliant principles. Mm -hmm. I have learned tons from Buddhists and uh, new ages and things like that and and I remain open because they they've got a, a a grasp on aspects of being that that I long for mm -hmm. but I will say this that all of that is just a drop in the ocean mm -hmm. compared to the infinite almighty person of God and the only way to him as Jesus said is through me so all of those should give us a hunger in our hearts and our souls mm. for truth because it's kind of like yeah and i did get that in my searching uh in buddhism and in uh, some of the the things that i was looking for truth i tasted it and i thought this is amazing mm. but it was unsustainable from the point that i needed to drive it now the the complete difference of of what i found in christ to everything else was that he found me Mm. I am being pursued. I've never had that before from a supernatural uh, being. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and as I look at the, at the scriptures and I read, I am the way, the truth, the life. I'm just using that one for this moment, but um, it makes me realize that there are many ways to Jesus. And certainly I took a very zigzag path to Jesus, mm. but there's only one way to the father, to God, and that is mm. through Jesus. And so, you can say, yes, that's your truth, and that's your truth. But, but, but Jesus doesn't say it like that. He says, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid there's only me. You, know? <laughs> you, can be a, you can be the very best Buddhist, but you can be the very best uh, Hare Krishna. You can be the very best Muslim, mm. but there is only one way. There is only one God. And the world doesn't like to hear that. You know? It doesn't like to be, um, because it's, it, it reflects our pride to think that we can mm. be, in control <laughs> yeah. and i think that's a that's a, a big question a big conversation is pride yeah well I, I look forward to having that with you in the future if you're open to it but thanks i mean we've got a bit of limited time here so i would like to um and and as you said there's a lot to talk about so I'm, i would love to have another conversation with you but um during this COVID-19 lockdown challenge that we found ourselves in, and you've referred to it on more than one occasion, so what struck me and what's really driven me to do what I'm doing is, is that in some way or another, we, all of us, are starting again or are having to begin again, um, be it in business, it could be, be in family, it could be in, in your um, faith in life, because our very core of that world that you refer to, which is material and having and the things that define you, has been rocked. 
So from your perspective uh, as, a, as an artist, uh, on the artist journey, as a Christian, as a um, firm believer and follower of Jesus Christ, what message would you give to those people out there, the audience that are listening to this, to, that you think could help them um, evolve? Um, and deal with the, the, the challenge of this new beginning that we're all going through? I mean, I, in some ways, I think this is like one of the greatest gifts given to us as a human species mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, because I just want to change hats a bit. I'm passionate about creativity. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe everyone is creative because I've seen the fruits of it. I've seen people uh, who, who believed incorrectly that they weren't creative produce amazing things and so what i am uh, my advice or my um passion to inspire or encourage during covid and during this lockdown is uh, is the rebirth or the refreshment and the relooking at creativity and there's nothing like constrained boundaries and confinement and isolation to give you time to play and to think and to, to take some risks within those small confines. And, uh, you know, imagination, a definition for imagination is the ability to bring to mind or the power to bring to mind things that aren't present. So everyone, wherever you are in any lockdown situation can imagine what it's like to walk the dog if you're unable to, to run in the hills, to swim in the oceans. They can, they, They've had, if you've had that experience, you can imagine it. Mm-hmm. Now, you can be imaginative all day and produce nothing, and, and that's of no value. However, the minute you apply that imagination just a little bit, mm-hmm. what you do is have creativity. So creativity, one definition is um, having original ideas that have value. And so I believe everyone can be imaginative, but you kind of need to apply that imagination. and. Uh, and in being creative, what you do, this is the exciting part for me. What you do is you, is you enter into your most, uh, what can I say, um, authentic self. Yeah, okay. Because what, it, what you draw from when you become creative is uh, something of faith, something of risk taking. Mm. You know what it's like to, to, to try and make something or to try and do something that you haven't done before where there's no plan is going to, there's bound to be a lot of mistakes. You know I mean? Edison yeah, yeah. said, you know, I haven't made 10,000 mistakes trying to work out how a light bulb works. I've just learned 10,000 ways that didn't work. Yeah. yeah. So I love that sort of, uh, that sort of thinking is to not be afraid. And again, it comes back to fear. We so bound by fear and that fear is controlled by our survival. So if we could actually just take that off the cards and not be concerned about our survival, we would do so much better. Yeah. But we are all bound by that. And yeah. We've got to find ways to deal with that reality. And, and that's a big question as well. But so to inspire people to be creative, to take small little risks, to risk little mistakes, for me, is like the healthiest, healthiest thing. Mm. Okay. So, so, I mean, again, we've got a couple of minutes here. But Duncan, really, thank you so much for that. Because that is, it's an inspiring to me. Um, being reminded that one of the basic principles we can fall back on is that and we all have this gift is the gift of imagination and um, we can we can imagine something better or we can imagine something worse um, either way we we will work to create that so so why not work so why not work to create something better and in that process of working to create something better um, yes um, right to the beginning, you said it doesn't mean life's easier. In actual fact, you've got to celebrate the fact that you're going to trip over and fall down because you know that you're creating something that is beautiful in the process. So, so, so thank you. Thank you so much for reminding me of that uh, because I too fall into the, the holes of despair and anger and frustration. And when you find yourself in those spaces, that darkness, then it's very easy to, cre- to, to imagine and take action to create the darkness because that's where, that's where you're pointing your laser. That's where you're pointing yourself. 
So um, thank you for yeah, thank you for reminding me to point my laser towards the light. My <laughs> <laughs> pleasure, AJ. <laughs> and I hope everybody else has been reminded of that too. Um, Duncan, listen, uh, we, we, time is up. Um, I would like to propose that we have another chat in the future, whenever that may be, because I really want to, to explore imagination and creativity a bit further with you um, and right. on your artist's path. Um, but really, thank you for your time. The views and opinions expressed by this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Three Seconds Ahead. Any content provided by our authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. While authors strive for accuracy, we can and will be wrong at times, as any honest person will have to admit.